In part one of this series, we built our creative contrast curve and we also imparted a split toning scheme. And as we saw, just these two ingredients alone, nothing else in the look can form the foundation of a really strong look. But today we wanna to go a little bit further. We're gonna add some things into the mix that are really gonna elevate and enhance this look that we are building right within the color page, right within Resolve. Before we dive in, if you are new to the channel, welcome. My name is Cullen. I love color grading. I love talking about color grading. I put out two new videos a week, plus a live session on Fridays where we explore the subjects that we've been talking about that week. So lots of cool color grading stuff happening here in the channel. If you are interested in this content, make sure you subscribe, make sure you turn on your notifications so that you're in the loop for all of the cool stuff that we do here on the channel. Let's dive into Resolve and talk about look development part two. And of course, if you haven't checked out part one of look development, make sure you do that. You're going to be lost otherwise, but assuming that you have, we're going to pick up where we left off. I'm here at the timeline section of my node graph. I've already got my color management set up. I've already got the first two ingredients of my look. Things are actually starting to come together pretty well just with what I've done thus far, but we want to go a little bit further now. And there's really two things that I want to talk about today that are going to allow us to polish and finesse this look and take it to the next level. First of them is to think about optimizing our color palette or our hues a little bit. So in the case of a film like this, if I flip through and look at the different shots that I have here in my timeline, one of the signature colors that I see is the yellow of these washing machines. So what I wanna do is sweeten this yellow a little bit, sort of preferentially adjust it. And what I like to use for that is my hue versus hue curves. Why do I use the hue versus hue curves? Because they're gentle and they are broad. And if we are setting them up correctly, we can really create a nice adjustment, a nice ingredient in our overall look without needing to worry about a hard edged or a harsh correction that's going to break the wrong image when it passes through this look. So it's nice and gentle and soft. So really what I wanna do is rotate the hue of these washing machines, I think I'd like to warm them up a little bit, make them a little bit more gold, a little bit less of a greenish yellow as they are now. And really the only trick there is I wanna make sure that the range that I'm selecting to warm is not including skin tone because these things are not super far away from each other. So let's turn our clips off for a minute here. And here's how I'm gonna go about that. I'm gonna tap here on the washing machine. And then I'm also just gonna tap on the skin of my subject here to make sure that I am not overlapping too much. And it looks like she is indeed kind of at this goalpost here for my initial qualification. So let's just see what happens if we grab this middle control point here and just start to rotate the hue to the right. Check out the vector scope. You can see that my yellows are getting kind of warmer and more orange. And if I zoom this image out, you can see that even just this little like three, four degree hue rotation that I've made, that's having a big impact on the image, isn't it? I'm actually gonna back this off and say just three degrees is plenty. And let's label this node hues, okay? And if I go into my light box view here, I wanna bounce around and I wanna see how this hue rotation is traveling and just look at what it's doing really to the washing machines in these different shots. And also make sure that when I look at my main character, that she's not being influenced too much by this hue rotation. This is a great example. And I do feel like I'm getting what I want on the washing machines and maybe I'm influencing her skin a little bit, but pretty minimally. So I'm pretty happy with that simple hue rotation. This is another ingredient that I almost always think about when I'm doing look dev, whether that's in Resolve or uh, in the more advanced uh, forms uh, and with different tools that I do my professional look development practice with. But here, right within Resolve, I'm thinking about hue rotation, and I'm just looking at the colors that I see in the various frames and thinking about whether I would like to see them mapped elsewhere. So in the case of this film, we got a lot of reds, a lot of yellows, and the yellows were really what stood out to me as uh, potentially being able to benefit from a hue rotation. Now, the reds, I do want to do something with, but that's something different than hue rotation. I'm really pretty happy with where those reds are sitting. If you look at a shot like this and we look at the vector, we're vectoring pure red and I don't necessarily want to like rotate them more orange or make them uh, sw start swinging toward magenta or anything like that. I'm happy with the hue of my reds. So in this case, my hues node, which might have multiple adjustments in this case is just going to be a simple four degree, three degree rotation of my yellows uh, to get them a little bit warmer. Okay. But this leads me right to the next thing that I want to talk about, 
What I would like to do with these reds is control their density. I would like to make them a little bit darker. Now, one option for that would be to use my hue versus loom curves. That is indeed what the hue versus loom curves are designed to do. And I could tap my preset for red and drag these down. And in the right shot, this is gonna work pretty well. But I'm gonna let you in on a secret. This hue versus loom curve is very, very difficult to get 100% clean. Just because of the nature of it, it's really difficult to dial it in in such a way that it is never introducing noise or artifacts into your image. So even though I like what it does and I like what I just saw it do, I tend to avoid it because in LookDev, we have to be thinking about not one shot, not 10 shots, we have to be thinking about 50 shots, 100 shots, 1,000 shots, depending on the uh, size of the project that we're building the look for. And there's nothing worse than building a look that works great for the first 100 shots, and then on shot 101, it breaks. That is no fun. When you are color grading, you wanna be in the color grade, not going, oh, my look's broken. I gotta get back over there and delete something or retool something to make it work more cleanly. We wanna be working cleanly from the outset and uh, invariably when we're doing look dev, so that when we're done with look dev, we're done with look dev and we can focus on grading. And if we want to refine our look, we can, but we don't need to go back and uh, fix something that has started to go wrong on uh, the wrong image set, okay? So for that reason, we are going to go about manipulating our densities in a different way. This looks more complicated than it is, but check this out. I'm gonna prepend a serial node here. By the way, you can play around with the order of the ingredients in your look. I generally prefer for my creative contrast curve to be the very last thing. And I like everything else to feed into it. That's not a hard and fast rule. It's not wrong to do it another way, but that's just a general rule of thumb that I use when I'm doing look dev uh, in Resolve or elsewhere. So here's what I wanna focus on now. How are we gonna do this density thing for these reds? We've got a new serial node here. We're now gonna create a layer mixer by hitting Option L. And here in the layer mixer, I'm gonna go over here to my composite mode and select color. And what that's gonna do is it's going to uh, take all of the color information from node number two here, the top layer, and then the luminance information is the, gonna be the only thing that we get from the bottom layer. So we're gonna combine that and the RGB mixer. Check this out, I really, really like this trick. We're gonna set our mode to monochrome here. And once I do that, you're gonna see that I can actually drop the density of my reds like so and this, in contrast to the hue versus loom adjustment, is very clean and very unlikely to break the image. So it's a really good option. So as I drop this down, you can see if I go before and after, I'm getting that sort of like filmic red density that I was looking for. And if we look at the net of what we've done here today, we're rotating hues and we're dropping our red density. It's not like, a crazy dramatic adjustment. Of course, we can see it as we flip it on and off, but this is really helping uh, the image in a number of ways. Like if we look at, you know, some of these shots, it's really gonna help like create color separation between our subject and the background. It's also gonna just kind of take us out of that like video-ish red that I'm perceiving a little bit when it's only the color management doing the work. And if we look at uh, any of our wide shots here, this is really just kind of like contouring the overall shot in a better way than we had before. And this is, by the way, before we've done any color grading. That's really the magic of good look development is it's giving you like a head start. It's cutting you to the front of the line when you get into your color grade because you've already got a vibe. You've already got a bunch of stuff that's working really well right off the truck before you even turn a single knob on any particular individual shot. And all the more so if we look at the full net of what we've done here in parts one and two, that's a big adjustment that we've ended up making here in net. And as I've pointed out in both parts of this series, this is just our sort of like foundation for our look. And once you get into your grade, there's no reason you can't periodically bounce back over after having evaluated the look on 10 or 20 or 30 shots and go, hey, I'm seeing a pattern here that I would like to adjust for a little bit and say, oh, the contrast is feeling a little bit too heavy or that red drop is a little bit too aggressive or whatever it may be. You can continue going in and refining it. But if you just take these four ingredients that we've built out here, creative contrast curve, split toning, some hue rotation, and then what we could call some hue density, you're off to a really great start. And of course, what I'm doing here in this density node is just one of many things that I could do. Maybe instead of dropping my reds, I might wanna drop my 
greens, like so. And you can see that's going to change the density of the other colors as greens get dropped down. Turns out there's not that much green in this image. Or I could look at dropping my blues, like so. Again, not a ton of blue in the image, so you're not going to see as much there. But you can play around with this RGB mixer in monochrome, top layer set to uh, the color composite mode, and get some really interesting and most important to me, really clean results in terms of color density. And it's a really great trick, a really great technique for manipulating your densities at the overall look level. And in doing so, getting your individual images, your shot by shot grading practice, that much closer to where you're gonna need to see things go. And basically, as I said, cutting you to the front of the line, making things a little bit simpler for you when you get into hands-on grading. So as we started off this series talking about, look development is a huge subject. That's why I've spent literally years studying it and training under some of our industry's best color scientists. And it's really what led me to develop products like my Voyager LUT pack, which do the kinds of things that we're talking about today and much, much, much more and allow you to benefit from the more sophisticated color science that's driving uh, what I'm doing just by applying a LUT or a series of LUTs in the case of the Voyager Pro Pack. So if you're in a hurry, you want to impart a really sophisticated, truly studio grade look onto your images and you don't want to be limited by what you're able to do well within Resolve, the Voyager LUT Pack is a great option to consider for getting really, really high quality looks and imparting them in a hurry onto your footage. And by the way, if you are enjoying what we're talking about today, if you're enjoying looking at this footage that we are grading today, I encourage you to check out my Colorist Career Accelerator that's coming up very soon. We've opened up the wait list for that course. We have a finite number of seats for it. Those seats always sell out pretty quickly after we uh, open up for uh, sale of the course. So I encourage you to uh, sign up for the wait list that I'm gonna leave a link to in the description for today's video. If you are interested in taking your career as a colorist to the next level, I don't care where it is today. I don't care if you've never graded a project professionally before, or if you've been in the business for 20 years, wherever you wanna go next is what we're gonna be focused on in the Colorist Career Accelerator in a four day intensive where we're gonna be going through every aspect of what it means to be a highly effective professional colorist. Creative considerations, technical considerations, business considerations, the stuff that I wish someone had been there to teach me at the beginning of my career. It's a really comprehensive and structured four day course where we're gonna walk you through everything you need to take your career from wherever it's at to that next level that you are trying to reach. So if you're interested in that, if you're interested in getting your hands on this footage so that you can practice with it and include it in your reel, definitely get on that wait list so that you are in the loop and on my newsletter so you know uh, what's going on with the Colorist Career Accelerator and you can sign up if you decide that it's the right time for you to do so. In the meanwhile, I hope you enjoyed this initial dive into look development and how we can effectively create basic looks right within Resolve when that's what we need to do. And if you wanna go further from here into look dev, as I said, it's a big subject. We can talk about it more uh, in an upcoming grade school live session, but look dev branches out from here and there's so much further we can go. But if you can master these four ingredients that we've talked about in the last two videos, you're actually gonna be well on your way to building up a highly effective and really enjoyable look development practice.